yet been recorded which attempts to keep winter from descending. On the contrary, the rites all prepare the community to endure. Together with the rest of nature, the season of the terrible cold, and in the spring the rites do not seek to compel nature to pour forth immediately corn, beans, and squash for the lean community. On the contrary, the rites dedicate the whole people to the work of nature's season, the wonderful cycle of the year, with its hardships and periods of joy, is celebrated and delineated and represented as continued in the life round of the human group. Many other symbolizations of this continuity fill the world of the mythological instructed community, for example, the clans of the American hunting tribes. themselves as descended from half animal, half human ancestors. These ancestors fathered not only the human members of the clan, but also the animal species, after which the clan was named. Thus the human members of the beaver clan were blood cousins of the animal beavers, protectors of the species, and in turn protected by the animal wisdom of the folk. Or another example, the Hogan or Mud Hut of the Navajos of New Mexico and Arizona is constructed on the plan of the Navajo image of the cosmos. The entrance faces east. The east sides represent the four corners and directions of the points between. Every beam and hoist corresponds to an element in the great Hogan of the all-embracing earth and sky. And since the soul of man itself is regarded as identical in form with the universe, the mud hut is representation of the basic harmony of man and world, and a reminder of the hidden life way of perfection. But there is another way in a diametric opposition to that of the social duty and the popular cult. From the standpoint of the way of duty, anyone in exile from the community is nothing. From the other point of view, however, this exile is the first step of the quest. Each carries within himself the all. Therefore, it may be sought and discovered within. The differentiations of sex, age, and occupation are not essential to our character but mere costumes which we wear for our time on the stage of the world. The image of man within is not to be confounded with the garments. We think of ourselves as Americans, children of the 20th century, Occidental, civilized Christians. We are virtuous or sinful, yet such designations do not tell what it is to be man. They denote only the accidents of geography, birth date, and income. What is the core of us? What is the basic character of our being? The asceticism of the medieval saints and of the yogis of India, the Hellenistic mystery initiations, the ancient philosophies of the East and of the West are techniques for the shifting of the emphasis of individual consciousness away from the garments. The preliminary meditations of the aspire detaches mind and sentiments from the accidents of life and drive him to the core. I am not that, not that, he meditates, not my mother or son who has just died, my body which is ill or aging, my arm, my eye, my head, not the summation of all these things. I am not my feeling, not my mind, not my power of intuition such meditation. He is driven to his own profundity and breaks through at last to unfathomable realizations. No man can return from such exercises and take very seriously himself as Mr. So-and-so of such and such township USA. Society and duties drop away and Mr. So-and-so having discovered 
discovered himself big with man becomes indrawn and aloof. This is the stage of Narcissus looking into the pool of the Buddha sitting contemplative under the tree, but it is not the ultimate goal. It is a requisite step, but not the end. The aim is not to see, but to realize that one is that essence, then one is free to wander as that essence in the world. Furthermore, the world too is of that essence, the essence of oneself and the essence of the world. These two are one, hence separateness, withdrawal is no longer necessary. Wherever the hero may wander, whatever he may do, he is ever in the presence of his own essence, for he has the perfected eye to see. There is no separateness, thus just as the way of social participation may lead in the end to a realization of the all in the individual, so that of exile brings the hero to the self in all. Centered in this hub point, the question of selfishness or altruism disappears. The individual has lost himself in the law, and being reborn in identity with the whole meaning of the universe, for him, by him, the world was made. O Muhammad, God said, hast thou not been, I would not have created the sky. The third section is called The Hero Today. All of which is far indeed from the contemporary view, for the democratic ideal of the self-determining individual, the invention of the power-driven machine, and the development of the scientific method of research have so transformed human life that the long-inherited timeless universe of symbols has collapsed in the faithful and book announcing words of Nietzsche's Zarathustra dead are all the gods. One knows the tale. It has been told a thousand times. It is the hero cycle of the modern age, the wonder story of mankind's coming to maturity, the spell of the past, the bondage of tradition was shattered with pure and mighty strokes. The dream web of myth fell away. The mind opened to full waking consciousness, and modern man emerged from ancient like a butterfly from its cocoon, or like the sun at dawn from the womb of Mother Night. It is not only that there is no hiding place for the gods from the searching telescope and microscope. There is no such society anymore as the gods once supported. The social unit is not a carrier of religious content, but an economic, political organization. Its ideals are not those of the heretic pantomime making visible on earth the forms of heaven, but the secular state in hard and unremitting competition for material supremacy and resources, isolated societies dream-bounded within a mythological charged horizon, no longer exist except as areas to be exploited of societies themselves, every last vestige of the ancient human heritage of ritual, morality, and art is in full decay. The problem of mankind today, therefore, is precisely the opposite to that of man in the comparatively stable periods of those great coordinating mythologies, which now are known as lies. Then all meaning was in the in the great anonymous forms, none in the self-expressive individual. Today no meaning is in the group, none in the world, all is in the individual, but there are meaning is absolutely unconscious. One does not know towards what one moves, one does not know by what one is propelled. The lines of communication between the conscious and the unconscious zone psyche have all been cut and we have been split in two. The hero deed to be brought is not today what it was in the century of Galileo, where then there was darkness 
darkness. Now there's light, but also where light was, there now is darkness. The modern hero deed must be that of questing to bring to light again the lost Atlantis of the coordinated soul. Obviously, this work cannot be wrought by turning back or away from what has been accomplished by the modern revolution, for the problem is nothing if not that of rendering the modern world spiritually significant, or rather phrasing the same principle the other way round, nothing if not that of making it possible for men and women to come to full human maturity through the conditions of contemporary life. Indeed, these conditions themselves are that which we have been rendered the ancient formulae in an effective, misleading, and even pernicious. The community today is the planet, not the bounded nation, hence the patterns of the projected aggression which formerly served to coordinate the in-group now can only break it into factions. The national idea with a flag as totem is today an aggrandizer of the nursery ego, not the annihilator of an infantile situation. Its parody rituals of the parade ground serve the end of old fast, and the numerous saints of this ancient anti-cult, namely the patriots, whose ubiquitous photographs draped with flags serves as official icons, are precisely local threshold guardians are demons sticky hair whom it is the first problem of the hero to surpass nor can the great world religions as at present understood meet the requirement for they have become associated with the causes of the factions as instruments of propaganda and self-congratulation even buddhism has lately suffered this degradation to reaction to the lessons of the West. The universal triumph of the secular state has thrown all religious organizations into such a def definitely secondary and finally ineffectual position that religious pantomime is hardly more today than a sanctimonious exercise for Sunday morning, whereas business ethics and stand for the remainder of the week. Such monkey holiness is not what the functioning world requires. Rather, a transmutation of the whole social order is necessary, so that through every detail and act of secular life, the vitalizing image of the universal God-man, who is actually imminent and effective in all of us, may be somehow made known to consciousness. And this is not a work that consciousness itself can achieve. Consciousness can no more invent or even predict an effectual symbol than foretell or control tonight's dream. The whole thing is being worked out on another level through what is bound to be a long and frightening process, not only in the depths of every living psyche in the modern world, but also on those titanic battlefields into which the whole planet has lately been converted. We are watching the terrible clash of the simpler grades through which the soul must pass identified with neither side. But there's one thing we might, may know, namely, that as the new symbols become visible, they will not be identical in the various parts of the globe. The circumstances of local life, race, and tradition must all be compounded in the effective forms. Therefore, it is necessary for men to understand and to be able to see that through various symbols the same redemption is revealed. Truth is one we read in the Vedas, and the sagas call it by many names. A single song is being inflicted through all the colorations of the human choir. General propaganda for one or another of the local solutions, therefore, is superfluous or much rather a menace. The way to become human is to learn to recognize the lineaments of God and all of the wonderful modulations of the face of man. With this we come to the final end of what the specific orientation of the modern hero task must be, and discover the real cause for the disintegration of all our inherited religious formulae. The center of gravity, that is to say, of the realm of mystery and danger, has definitely shifted, for the primitive hunting peoples of those remotest human millenniums, when the saber tooth
instances of the animal kingdom were the primary manifestations of what was alien, the source at once of danger and of sustenance. The great human problem was to become linked psychologically to the task of sharing the wilderness with these beings. An unconscious identification took place, and this was finally rendered conscious in the half-human, half-animal figures of the mythological totem ancestors. The animals became the tutors of humanity. Through the acts of literal imitation, such as local appear only on the children's playground or in the madhouse, an effective annihilation of the human ego was accomplished, and society achieved a cohesive organization. Similarly, the tribes supporting themselves on plant food became cathected to the plant. The life rituals of planting and reaping were identified with those of human procreation, birth and progress to maturity. Both the plant and the animal worlds, however, were, in the end, brought under social control, whereupon the great field of instructive wonder shifted to the skies, and mankind enacted the great pantomime of the sacred moon king, the sacred sun king, the heretic planetary state, and the symbolic festivals of the world-regulating spheres. Today all of these mysteries have lost their force. Their symbols no longer interest our psyche. The notion of a cosmic law which all existence serves, and to which man himself must bend, has long since passed through the preliminary mystical stages represented in the old astrology, and it is now simply accepted in mechanical terms as a matter of course. The descent of the Occidental sciences from the heavens to the earth, from 17th century astronomy to 19th century biology, and the concentration today at last on man himself in 20th century anthropology and psychology mark the path of prodigious transfer, the focal point of human wonder. Not the animal world, not the plant world, not the miracle of the spheres, but man himself is now the crucial mystery. Man is that alien presence with whom the forces of egoism must come to terms, through whom the ego is to be crucified and resurrected, and in those image societies is to be reformed. Man understood, however, not as I, but as thou, for the ideals and temporal institutions of no tribe, race, continent, social class, or century can be the measure of the inexhaustible and multifariously wonderful divine existence that is the life in all of us. The modern hero, the modern individual who dares to heed the call and seek the mansions of that presence with whom it is our whole destiny to be atoned, cannot, indeed, must not, wait for his society to cast off its slough of pride, fear, rationalized avarice, and sanctified misunderstanding. Live, Nietzsche says, as though the day were here. It is not society that is to guide and save the creative hero, but precisely the reverse. And so every one of us shares the supreme ordeal, carries the cross of the Redeemer, not in the bright moments of his tribe's great victories, but in the silences of his personal despair. So that is the end of the hero with a thousand faces uh, this book was a book that I read in college and I remember being particularly uh, interested in it because of all of the mythology what I forgot was that uh, it was actually a little bit difficult to read, meaning when I was reading it silently, you know, um, I wasn't paying attention to the mispronunciation of certain names and words, but um, as I've been whisper reading it for the last couple of uh, months now, actually, um, I realized this is actually a little bit difficult to read um, in a whisper context, but in any case, I was, uh, it was a lesson learned in terms of, um, finding a book that is interesting, but is also kind of easy to read, because the way that this worked, it, it kind of went back and forth between, uh, sections of myths, and then, um, 
audiences have their own language, like their own um, uh, speech pattern, and uh, they're from different cultures, and so when it's translated into English, they all have a different rhythm, and then Joseph uh, has his own um, rhythm in, it, in the way that he communicates, so uh, it was interesting going
examples and the language used was just a little bit archaic so it's difficult sometimes to get a full understanding of what he's talking about but you can definitely see the um, repetition especially when you look at modern movies like Star Wars is one of the best examples where um, you know directly mythology was part of the the Star Wars saga, the story, and the hero's journey um, are directly reflective of mythology. And I think there was a, a series on TV on PBS that was explaining how Lucas used, um, I think they were saying that he was using the Hindu mythology, but it, that concept, the concepts that are presented, are found in mythologies all over the world, whether it was um, from or Christian texts or whatever it, it was, it's repeated over and over again. So there's a reason for it and it's interesting to investigate. Um, and in terms of the uh, conspiracy element, all of the uh, occult stuff is related to, you know, this particular belief system and the the stuff that is presented like in a music video or anything like that it goes by this pattern and although a person might want to say okay it's a cult so it's maybe like a negative thing it really doesn't mean that a cult just means hidden so this is like a hidden philosophy that is, exists and the power structure for whatever reason is particularly uh, interested in it and they repeat its use over and over again and it you know maybe it's something that is just marketable that human beings like you know the same thing and they can understand the same concepts over and over again it's not really clear but it's definitely part of the secret kind of um, religious beliefs that come out of uh, hermetics and um it was later divulged in mythology and then the various magical uh, belief systems and secret societies and the sort of resurgence of uh, this hidden or occult knowledge then became part of even modern day uh, philosophies as well as psychology. So it's all kind of connected and uh, that, th that was the reason that I w chose this book as something to look at so I hope you guys enjoyed it and um, we will start another series soon I am thinking about something that hopefully will be a little easier for me to uh, read something that was written maybe not too long ago so the language the rhythm of the language should be um, easier to read in a whisper context okay guys have a nice night Thanks for listening. Bye.